Good afternoon. Welcome to Fishing Without Failure. Or frustration, for that matter. Or how I learned to stop worrying and love the layer eight. Otherwise known as 11 Stories of Fail. Brought to you by Jay Beal. Larry Pesci. Yay. Woo! <laughs> Welcome to day what ever of DEF CON. Um, some of you, this may actually be a continuation of yesterday because you haven't slept yet. Okay. Or some of you, you got lots of sleep, right? Who got lots of sleep? Lies. <laughs> Lies. If you see anybody wandering around and kind of looking, uh, if you could either choose one of two takes, either ignore them fully, like just, I would stare right over their shoulder, menacing growl, let them know that there's no way they're getting a seat, or, well, uh, let's go for the second option. Please uh, scoot in, make room, uh, pull your legs back, uh, make friends. Hopefully you all showered today? Nope. Okay. All right. <laughs> yep, I did. Thank you. All right. So let's talk about some, uh, some fishing without failure and frustration. So as, as us, for, for Jay and I and, and the In Guardians crew, um, this stuff for fishing should be really easy. Um, from the technical side, you know, you create a really witty or crafty email that sends the readers to a, a website with some URL. Um, you set the website up. I mean, this is easy. You need Apache on Linux. It takes you about 10 minutes to do. It's one form. You, you build a one form page really crappy with H1 tags and blink and marquee and we collect credentials. We get Client approval of steps one and two, and we send that email to as many email addresses that we can possibly find. And you and watch then, the passwords fly in. Yeah. And it's, you get eh, 10 to 40% of the employees in most cases, and uh, sometimes you get lucky and it really is this easy. Yeah. And now our job is done, right? So thanks for coming. Um, that's how you do fishing without frustration. No. Welcome to fishing. This is all there is to it. <laughs> no. It doesn't work that way. It'd be nice if it did. Sometimes you get really lucky. However. Sometimes you get really, really lucky. Larry Pesci here uh, once had a fishing campaign with a success rate of more than 100%. He sent an email out to some number of employees of the company, like let's call it half the employees. And uh, he had the, the, the routine scary email that has all the things it needs to have. It has to have a call to action. That call to action has to say bad things will happen otherwise or engage you to be helpful and has to give you a nice, nice deadline, right? So he crafted that email great and, uh, and it scared people hardcore. So they forwarded that email. The people who got it and their, and their colleagues hadn't gotten it, they forwarded it over to them too. They're like, dude, you have to do this or else your access is going to get cut off. And then... But I didn't get that email. Can oh, you forward it to me? I'll send you a copy. Um, and the people who were sending copies out actually sent copies out to their uh, out, out to their other accounts. So a lot of us, a lot of us, you know, we've got our we've got a normal user account, we've got our admin account, and then we've got our domain admin account. And so you you got it on one of the three, and you send it to the other two, and just to make sure that Larry gets domain admin passwords. Bingo. It worked out really well. I hope it everybody. Did. I hope I'm not too old, uh, and uh, and everyone does recognize excess. Uh, our rates no, in excess of no, 100%. You're, all too, the you're, too, old. you're too old. You're too old. So am I. Yeah. All right. So wh why are we doing this fishing to begin with? So the intent for doing the fishing to begin with, you probably don't need to tell a lot of you, but to, to make sure we're covering all of our bases. We're here to try to do this fish to, quote, make the organization staff hard-ass mofos, Right? We're trying to build the firewall of the human, right? We're trying to train the users to be better at this so that they don't click on stuff. Okay. And this stuff works after, a, you know, after, you, after you get through your second or third time getting, you know, finding out that you got caught by a fish, you tend to be a heck of a lot better. You're, you're a little gun shy. Right? Yeah. yeah. You start looking at every one of those emails rather critically and going, is this real or not? And sometimes the fishes are so good you, you question. Uh, I, I have actually seen some folks send me some sample phishing emails and almost clicked on them because they were that good. 
Like, why did I just get an email from FedEx? I know I'm waiting for a FedEx package. Uh, no, don't, don't click that. Don't click that. So it, it's about hardening the humans and not necessarily testing the technology to prevent it from getting in the organization in the first place. Now, the problem is that most people's, if you're, so we're taking, the, we're taking the perspective that you are either a consultant like us or you're in your own organization, you're trying to get a phishing program going to harden your users. Yep, which ultimately, if you're running a phishing campaign in your own organization, uh, so when we say clients, we mean potential clients that we work with from a consulting perspective, or you are in fact having your users and your organization be your clients. You are working within your department and your management and you are a client of that management staff. Yeah, when I was internal, I like to think of myself as, I like to still think of myself as a consultant. Um, I still, I like to think of myself as having clients because that got me to understand who I was trying to serve. Um, okay, so most people's attempts don't go this well. Uh, years ago, when InGuardian started doing more regular phishing work, when we were doing it often, um, we'd watch our consultants get so frustrated with the situation when they were, when they were phishing. And, uh, and we got better. And so we, the rest of this talk is talking about all the frustrating situations that we and others ran into and trying to tell you, teach you how to avoid them yourselves so you can just have fun with this. Because phishing, when it goes well, is really, really fun. Get the passwords, harden the users, make everybody happy. This is awesome. Um, but for most people, their first attempt or two or three ends up being frustrating in a way that leaves them blaming their client, blaming themselves, frustrated, and um, even though they get technical success, uh, they end up just saying, God, I hope I don't have to do that again. All right, so we're taking the approach of more of a pen test type of uh, scenario here. This isn't about uh, the, the red team, although red team is the quote, new sexy. Um, we do that too, but we're talking um, a little bit more about doing a generalized based attack as opposed to a very specific targeted red team type of attack. Okay. We're going to share uh, 11 stories of our, our failures and the solutions that we found that seem to work really well to avoid those. And we're going to generalize. We're going to generalize this. And honestly, this is this stuff should be useful way outside of fishing. It should be useful in the rest of your professional life. It should be useful in your families. Um, so we're basically going to say that any effort that you're any effort you're you're uh, attempting professionally, it's going to involve a certain amount of and hopefully and usually more than you realize. Communication, collaboration, and negotiation. And I'll say something like this again, but I want you to know. Uh, my rule is anything in life that involves one, more than one person, it's a negotiation whether you realize it or not. Yep. Otherwise, you're just playing with yourself. <laughs> you're the expert there. <laughs> somebody's got to do it. It's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. All right. So uh, red team fishing, uh, on the other hand, uh, as opposed to sort of more traditional pen test type fishing, um, we're looking for that not to test everyone. We're looking at for that for an access methodology. And it's going to be a very detailed, tailored, uh, very focused uh, attack with a very small pool of emails, typically one to ten, usually one to two, sometimes even just one. Um, we're going to do lots of open source intelligence. We're going to be uh, delving into finding out what attack is going to work and what attack is going to work the first time because that's all we've got. And we need to build a lot of infrastructure around that um, with, with having uh, backstories and great pretexts and you name it. We're going to have to spend lots and lots of time for a single red team type phishing email. It may take months to construct from both the email content to building uh, fake LinkedIn profiles to uh, setting up domains and, and, and you name it to, to build that specific pretext. And getting, those, and getting those domains to have some history behind them so that they'll make it through the, uh, so they'll make it through the filters. Right, so that they have some, some provenance, as it will, uh, so that the, the, those domains that we want to use for phishing have uh, some trust based on um, use and organizational application and so forth. Um, and some of the things that we found that work really well is using either Office 365 or Gmail, uh, Google services, uh, to use their trust um, for all of the, the spam uh, filtering and so forth, uh, to have that reputation built by others first. Their mail servers often get whitelisted, so you get the emails through easy. 
So, like we said, we're going to tell you 11 stories from real-life experience. Each one of them inform the way that we run our fishing engagements, and honestly, over time, they start to inform the way that we do work for clients and run our company. Um, so, as I said, we're going to give you this advice as if you're either one of us, a consultant, or, whether, or if you're inside a company and you're trying to do a fishing campaign yourself. Okay. So, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Right. There is possibly no way we can have any of this fishing fail. I mean, this is, this is not going to go wrong like this cat attacking this particular balloon, right? Because you know what's going to happen here. The cat is going to jump off the door, the door is going to swing closed, or it doesn't swing closed and they catch the balloon and plummet to the floor. Or they grab the balloon and the balloon pops and then you know what happens when the cat has a balloon that pops? It's messy. It's messy. Really messy. First hand, yes. Yes. Yeah. It scares, it's, it scares the crap out of them, literally and figuratively, sometimes. <laughs> All right. So first one, uh, schedule failing. Um, you, you do a great job. You work with your client. You get, uh, you get the test on the calendar. Uh, it, it's ready to go. You talk with the client. And uh, you give them three individual pretexts uh, to choose from. Uh, you send those over to the client. Uh, the, the contact that you're working with uh, picks the context. Um, you get all of that built by, by Wednesday uh, in preparation to send the email out on Friday so that uh, it's in their email boxes uh, first thing on Monday morning so that all, all of the folks are, are looking at it. Um, they get it Wednesday, uh, send over all the stuff so that they can review it, um, looks good, and then you find out that uh, on Thursday, your contact pushes the email up the chain a little bit and says to the manager, hey, this is the, this is the phishing pretext that we're going to use, and we're going to get these emails somewhere between Friday and Monday. Just a quick FYI, I, I thought, I, I thought it would be a good idea to, to show it to you, kind of like a last minute, here you go, just want to let you see it. And the manager says... What the heck is this? You can't do this. This is this is all wrong. Uh, all our users are going to fall for this, or this is too believable, or we're going to get in so much trouble. No, you have you have to start back over or, again. Or this has objectionable material in the uh, you know you can't you can't actually try to sell medicinal drugs to make things you know bigger or smaller <laughs> or whatever. Or stand up longer or yeah. We're trying to make some side money. <laughs> yeah. So now the manager comes back and says, "No, there's no way. You start start the pretext over. You can't use this one. Um, do this instead." And now the, your contact comes back to you and says, so, uh, so Larry, Jay, uh, I'm sorry, but we have to pick a different pretext. And we've got to start from scratch. You're going to have to build completely new dynamic material. This is going to take a little while. And as a consulting firm, we're always worried about schedule because if somebody starts from scratch, all of a sudden that thing we were supposed to do next week, we're going to be doing something else. And, uh, and we've got someone in the front row of this talk, actually, who has to manage changing us to the something else. And, uh, yes, which she refers to it as changing the schedule as uh, rearranging her Tetris board. Yes, because it's like, where do you fit these pieces in with these players? And uh, it becomes a mess trying to juggle that stuff. But when you do this internally, if you're not us, if you're not an outside company, or you're doing this as an internal project, you might think schedules don't matter. And the thing is, if a project starts to run late, we all know this from IT, if a project starts to run late, it starts to lose credibility. And once that credibility is lost, you risk the project getting shut down or not repeated or budget or whatever. And so it's important to not, it's important to stay on time and it's important to get it right the first time. So, yep. So don't blow your schedule to bits and make sure that you communicate with the organizations to let them know what some of this stuff looks like. And yes, this is what happens when apparently you fail to communicate when creating some labor at labeling. And yes, Arabic is spelt two different ways because they misspelled it one of the two times, right? Diesel fuel in Arabic and then non-smoking in Arabic. Okay. All right. So how do we fix it? This is the opportunity for you to lead. Woo! Never thought you'd be a leader, did you? Okay, guess what? You're going to be a leader. Hey, we need to start having uh, some conversation with uh, the folks in the organization to lead them through this from the beginning. Hey, we need to have this approved before we even start building some of this stuff. Um, let them know what you're, you're brainstorming. Uh, let them have some input into some of the, the pretext development. 
at the at the end of the day, at the end of the day, even if you know, even if you're you're not a manager, or, or you know, you're inside a company, you're not a manager, you're a consultant, or what have you, you may feel like you're not the boss, right? It's not, you know, but at the end of the day, you're you're the one who has the responsibility to get this project done and to make it work and work well, and that means you do have to stand up and lead. You have to, someone has to stand up and say, this is what we're going to do, and so. What we do is basically, what, what we do when we get this right is we say, okay, this is what the process is going to be, here's where the milestones are going to be, here's what has to be done by when, and by the way, you know, if this doesn't, if, if this part doesn't work right, if we don't hit that milestone, this is one of the things that's happened in the past. Um, so there are a few other, there are a few other things you find out, find out before you even start creating your pretext, who can veto it, and you get them involved. And you tell them the risk. Then maybe give them some deadlines or figure out how long they need to get that reviewed so that you can schedule accordingly. Hey, uh, we're going to send this over to you. Um, who are you going to send it to to get to take a look at it? How long do you think it's going to take them? Can we set a deadline so that we can now continue to move forward and we sort of know what the rest of that schedule is going to look like? And give them some call to actions uh, for, for limiting that time frame for, for that approval. Make sure they know how long it's going to take. Make sure you know whether what time amount of time you've said is actually reasonable. So, yep. Okay. Um, don't build your entire prototype of your pretext until you actually have approval. Like, don't spin your wheels building this huge thing for your pretext. All the background of the pretext to find out that. I just wasted 40 hours building this pretext and it's no good. Well, maybe I can use it on another client, but depending on how tailored it is to that individual client, may maybe not so much. So the other part of this is basically just realize you're talking to one person, you're talking to your client, you're talking to your boss, you're in a multi-party negotiation whether you realize it or not because the organization or your client's got a whole bunch of people. So you're in a, you're in a multi-party negotiation and it's up to you to lead it and rock it and, um, and make sure that you're involving enough people. So how many of you guys are introverts in this room? Don't all raise your hands at once. Okay, I know you're being introverted, right? Yeah, that guy in the back, he's clearly an introvert, right? Yeah. Who's no. not an introvert? Who's an extrovert? They tend to raise their hands more. Yeah. Yeah, not many, not many of you. I, I just, and that's, Whose arms don't work? And, that, and that's pretty endemic in our, in, in our industry, right? You know, I think a lot of the folks that I run into, that uh, they deal with technology because they don't want to have to deal with people. Well... Unfortunately, we have to deal with people, right? Yeah. So some introvert pro tips. Um, it, it's about when you're going to communicate and ultimately the type of communication. So if you communicate more in the beginning about this whole process, the communication will be much better. You get an opportunity to excel and to lead and to have fun. Or if you don't communicate enough, you end up in these other these last three bullets, which we all which sucks, and it takes longer too. So it's more effort. And that's you're talking about the frustrations, you're assigning blame, you're talking about why the project didn't work, you're lamenting the failure, and people are getting angry and finger pointing, and that never goes well. And it's it's not nice, and it, it makes you not want to do this, and it makes you frustrated. So communicate more in the beginning. Cool. I can't wait until my kids start sending me Father's Day cards via email because they're cheap, right? I already do that. <laughs> See, I can't send Father's Day cards. Well, I can't send Mother's Day cards. My father passed away. So I can't send Mother's Day cards to my mom via email. You know why? She can't use a computer. Okay. <laughs> she took, I took it away from her. <laughs> All right. So, What's the point what, of the slide again? So what do you, what do you, what do you mean? Please don't transcribe what, that. What, <laughs> <laughs> oh, now we can mess with the transcriptionists? No. <laughs> no, stop it, Jay. All right. So did you check your spam folder? Yeah. What happens when your fish ends so up in the spam is, folder? So this is, uh, this is something that happened that, that, that used to happen to us. We actually had one of these happen to us recently, um, you know, but in our story, you spend a whole bunch of time developing that pretext, the landing page, go through all the negotiation we've been talking about, none of your emails make it through the organization spam filters. At this point, the spam filters have been trained on your email, so you don't get to use it in the future. So your spam filters trigger maybe because your domain's too new or it, it has broken SPF or maybe just the spam filters get lucky and you're back to the drawing board, schedule suffers, your contact or your contact or your boss is annoyed. Yeah, check out this pretext. Let's go test it. No, it doesn't work. 
Oh. Testing would be good. So let's do some user testing on our user testing. So we've tested the test with some user testing. Right. Okay. Yo, dog. OK, right. this is the one technical slide we have this entire talk. So on the technical side, go and configure SPF and DKIM. Use, a, you know, use an MTA that you've tested. It's had a domain for, it's had a domain for at least a week, and it's been assigned to do that. And um, uh, uh, it's a pro tip. Do your IPv6 assignments uh, for all of the services as well. Uh, we recently had a mail server that would do uh, SPF records. Uh, one of our clients had a mail server that did uh, SPF record lookups and preferred IPv6 over IPv4. And the IPv6 lookup would fail. And then because our SPF record wasn't appropriate, they would drop the mail as spam because it was via IPv6 and not IPv4. And it took us forever to figure out why this stuff was not making it through. So. so with that said, we like the human fix for this one. Basically, you talk, to your, you talk to your client, your contact, your boss, and you say, you're testing the humans, not the technology. The point of, we've talked about red teaming, and it had a different focus. But in this, you look and say, what's the overall mission? The overall mission was to get an email to everybody in the org or to a large portion of the org and see how they respond to an actual phishing email. So if the technical solutions get in the way, uh, then you're not getting, you're not actually able to do the test. So at this point, we're going to go and ask to be whitelisted. Hey, could you just let our mail server send through? And right. make sure that you budget time and to test the whitelist, because if you don't, then you still end up in this failure if your whitelist was set up and didn't work. Yep. So for example, this is testing the human, not the technology, because we, we know the technology fails. H how many of you folks have a spam filtering or some type of solution in your organization. Yeah. How many of you still get spam? I rest my case, right? It's broken. It doesn't always work. So it's not about testing the technology. You know you have it. You know it doesn't always work. And it takes one email to get into someone's environment for one person to click on. And you know it's going to get there. Because do you know why they keep doing spam? It because it works. <laughs> yeah. Damn it. So, all right, math, math is hard. Find the volume and surface of the area right of the cylinder. Sushi. Sushi. So, the numbers game fail. Okay, so some, some interesting things, you know, you're going to go do a, a phishing test and you need to have some emails to, to send these to. You use all of the best tools in your arsenal to go collect email addresses from the internet. Uh, Multigo, you, you name it, Google, uh, all of the tools that you use to populate those list of emails from publicly available sources. And you end up with 15 email addresses in a company that has 1,000 employees. This is not a good test. Okay, so you're really looking to test all of the humans and to see how all of the humans react to based on some of their internal training or to gauge how, what type of training that they need to do. You need a whole lot of email addresses. 15 isn't going to cut it. The, the, thing is, what the thing is, the black hats, they get to brute force the mail servers to find valid email addresses. They get to send you tons of spam to do that. They get to buy mailing lists. And if they're particularly questionable, this, this guy named Bob, uh, they can go and say, pull all the pager traffic if, uh, if their client is a, if their client or their target, well, not their client, if their, uh, if their victim is a, uh, say, a hospital nearby with tons of pagers going. Uh, that'll get you some, that'll get you some addresses. Yes, that'll get you some addresses. So, math, why are you so hard, right? Why, why does this have to be so hard? Why, how can we get around this whole 15 email address problem and, and be semi-ethical about it and or do this affordably and not have to buy really expensive mailing lists and, or, or do bad things with Poxag and flex pager traffic? So let's just, let's, just tell the, let's just tell the client or the boss that an attacker could get a really comprehensive list of email addresses. Yeah, because we know they can. We know they can. Because we know they can. We'll, when we say, when we tell them that, we're going to prove it. Um, yep. I, I, I can brute force every email address at your mail server. You're not going to like it. Okay. <laughs> It's going to be a bad day for your email admin. So the, the thing that, you know, the, the, objection, you know, the objection that we might get from purists is like, no, wait a second, you want this to be an accurate test. And I'll say this is where the red teams, you know, military red teams for a long time have been throwing, a, have been saying, this is our white card. Um, we're going to say, let's just stipulate that we could get all the email addresses, you give them to us. Um, and that way we're spending our time in smarter ways. Um, so in our case, this is, this is the first place where the, the negotiations really becomes really obvious. Okay, 
your client may just say, no, I don't want to. And at that point, you have the opportunity to just walk away, say, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send him 15 emails. This phishing test is going to suck. And, you know, it's okay. It'll be his fault. So I don't care. But most of us, when we do anything in life, we actually care about the outcomes. And when we say, I don't care, we're usually in some kind of pain. Um, so what we could do instead is try to get creative. We could talk to our client and say, how about this? We'll do the first step. We'll find all the addresses we can find. And if that's 15, great. If it's 1,000, great. At the end of that, we're going to give you those addresses. We'll put them in the report. Heck, if you want, we'll do those first. But ahead of time, give us the rest of the email address of the organization. That way, we get to do a comprehensive test where we know that we actually got to test a large, large enough number of users to be helpful. And you get to get that thing you wanted, which was that accuracy. You can kind of see both outcomes. And it won't ruin your day when we topple over your mail server by sending it too much mail, right? And you, your email admins will have a bad day for that. And you know, maybe not engaging in illegal behavior for finding uh, uh, addresses via other, other means. Okay. So, next so story. You know, brace yourselves. The open floor plan office is coming. Winter is coming. Winter is coming. So your email, uh, let's consider a pretext. I did this once. Um, your email says it's you, from... You considered a pretext once? I did. Okay, good. No, I wrote one, damn it. Okay, good. Have you been drinking again? Not yet. Okay. So the email says it's from Robert Smith. He's the Director of Information Technology. You send it out. The Director of Information Technology says anybody who's given their password is going to lose their job, blah, 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 this kind of thing. That's my pretext. Uh, I didn't really know my client. The whole organization sat on one floor in a very large airplane hangar style building um, in an open floor plan. And so people just started going, walking over to Robert's desk here, at which point he alerts everybody. He a few, tells a few of them, and then one of them stands up and says, Hey, that email from Bob, don't open it! And your success rate goes to <laughs> utter dog. <laughs> yeah, what success rate? Yeah. Yeah. So having an open floor plan has helped me bond with my coworkers who also despise having an open floor plan, right? Okay, so know your target. Know, know what the environment looks like um, as part of developing that pretext because again, you wanna help the, the folks that you're testing to become better. You wanna have uh, some good success and uh, not have the alerts. You wanna test individual people and not have that, that alert go out necessarily so that all those people can get tested. Talk with your client about what does the office look like? Hey, who may be a good person in the organization for us to send an email in from if it's a legitimate source? Um, what day is he going to be on vacation so they can't go over to his office and knock on his door and, uh, and see, hey, did you send that email? No, find out what do you, when he's going to be on vacation. Um, find out where people sit in the organization. Is it difficult for them to potentially go ask those, uh, those folks? Um, Talk about what their escalation procedure is for uh, getting uh, spam emails and malicious emails and those types of things. So then you can start understanding who they're going to potentially escalate it to. So maybe you can notify those people to say, hey, you just got an escalation. Good. We're doing a phishing campaign. Don't tell anyone. Okay? See how many people report it. Absolutely. So um, the other big one for us that we learned was make your, make your client or your, or your, your contact at, uh, within your organization and at least one level of management above them part of the pretext brainstorm. So you catch, you catch things early. They tell you, yeah, that, that's not going to work. We all sit on one floor. Yeah, they're, they're, everybody's just going to walk over to Bob's office and ask him if he sent the email. Okay. I'm going to let this one speak this? for itself. Right. Okay. Okay. So here's another one I've, I've gotten nailed by. Your client asks you to send the email slowly so that you're going to avoid detection. Just, you know, send one, wait 10 more minutes, send one. By the time you've got 10 emails out, what's that? Math is hard, an hour and 40 minutes. You've given people plenty of time and someone's gone and alerted security or compliance or the help desk. They send out a mass email, the jig is up. You're yep. You've only got 140 email addresses into the organization out of 3,000, and your campaign is effectively over. That wasn't a good test of the humans. Okay. So the only time you should be doing low and slow is barbecue, Carl. Come on. That's how you do good barbecue. Low temperature, long period of time. God. F my life. <laughs> Barbecue, barbecue, Carl, barbecue. 
All right. So phishing is truly about speed. You want to get it as many emails in front of people's eyes before they can collectively make a decision that this is bad and pass notifications. You're racing the organization's ability to communicate and collaborate and detect you, and they will. Humans are social creatures. Yep. Oh, wait, this whole talk's about communication. Right. You're, you're trying to exploit the race condition of getting your email in front of as many eyeballs as possible uh, before they start communicating internally that, hey, maybe we have a problem and start doing some reporting. And so make sure your deadline is really soon. Don't give them two days. Don't, tell, don't even give them a day. You want to get people into the lizard brain part that's scared and has to act fast. And the other reason you want to make them act fast is so they don't have a chance to talk to each other. Because yep. communication is their big, their big defense. Yep. And that, that's one of the other things, sort of as, a, as an aside, that we found that has worked really well um, in, the, in the phishing. If you're asking someone to perform some action, give them a call to action and have some penalty behind it. Um, hey, if you don't go to this website and put in your username and password, in the next 15 minutes, we're cutting off your access. And what happens when you cut off their access? You can't do your job. And then your manager gets mad at you. So what do they do? Oh, crap, I better go do this. Before the lizard part of the brain catches up and says, this is not, where did my tail go? Oh, right. So you're exploiting that race condition. Okay, okay so. Is, is my tail sticking out? All right. Okay. So this poor gentleman, he chose poorly. This is, in fact, not Indy. He was not named after the dog, right? I remember... So, he didn't do that, right? Yeah, yeah. He, dr he drank from the wrong chalice, right? Okay. So, Jay? Sure. So, poor domain choice. We, uh, everyone learns this one really early on. You choose a domain badly. Um, one of the great things that most, uh, that most people, most noobs will try, um, and I'm not going to admit whether I've done this too, is they will pick, uh, they'll, you know, they've got their target, Eli Lilly, and we've never done work for Eli Lilly, so... I felt safe putting them in here. Hopefully. They just happen to have a company name that has lots of I's and L's that can be replaced with ones. So, you know, you try something along the lines of changing an L or an I to a one or changing an I to an L or an L to an I. Uh, the problem font, is... Font collision attack. Nice. And, the problem is the employees are trained to catch this. This is like one of the few things that user awareness training does tend to get consistently right across the organization. So nobody's fooled. Your numbers are awful and everyone says... Uh, yeah, they, didn't, they don't do good phishing tests. You don't want that to be you. Nope. So choose wisely, right? Okay. Drink from the woodcutters, uh, the, uh, the carpenter's chalice, right? Not the most lavish one because, yeah, that's not the right one. Okay. So pick a really good domain. Use the, use the customer or use your name in the domain, but add additional, quote, entropy to it. Um, you know, in this case, uh, say Eli Lilly Benefits, um, or pick a domain that uh, you, you can use for multiple clients and then use subdomains per uh, to sort of make it look like maybe you've partnered with a third party um, so that the they now have multiple subdomains for each one of the, the, the clients and so forth. Um, and, and honestly, figure out what will work. So you're going to come up with those ideas. And before you just stand up the domain and go on ahead, um, go and talk to your client, but also go and talk to your coworkers. Um, you know, one of my coworkers that's sitting in the front row, John Sawyer, is the one who got, us on, who, got, who got me to pick better domain names and told me what kinds of things worked. And one of the other coworkers uh, who's also sitting up front is the guy who said, you know what, we should use domains, we should buy domains, keep them for the long term, and start using subdomains of those. And um, honestly, just talk to other people and collaborate. That's the, the biggest thing with, so phishing is, is one of those things where we all just think, okay, it's a one person job, I'm gonna sit down and do it myself. And, um, and then whatever goes wrong, you're like, ah, oh, shit, we could have avoided that. But if you talk to more people, whether it's at your client, whether it's in your company, that collaboration ends up producing better results. Yep. Don't do it in a vacuum. So, um, so what if your client, this is where we're going to break from a story or, or talk a little bit more about this story. What if your client is the one who asked you to take their Eli Lilly domain name or what have you and change the L to a 1? So the client, in fact, wants to choose poorly. The client wants to choose poorly. You know it's, you know it's not going to work. You know why it's not going to work or, or you think it's, it's really unlikely to work all that well. And now you, real, now you have to realize you're in a negotiation. You know, you can just say... Uh, he made me do it. He made me pick a bad domain, so it didn't work out so well. It's all his fault. Who yep. cares? I don't care. Yeah. You, Screw that. You know, as humans, that's not what we're about. We care about what we do. 
Yeah. So we want to make it better. So, so realize that this effort's about collaborating, about communicating, about negotiating. So the, the easiest way to lose in a negotiation um, is to not realize you're in one and you're basically always in one. Um, but sometimes that means that you, you have something besides just yes or no, besides just go with his idea or you know, stomp, stomp your feet on your own idea, and that's to get more creative. Um, sometimes that's as simple as just saying, okay, I, I'm not really sure about that one. Before we lock in on it, can we brainstorm as part of a larger group? Can we, uh, you know, can we get some more people from your organization in? And yeah, somebody else calls somebody else calls bull on the on the domain, and and that makes it easier. Yeah. So more choosing poorly, right? The amount of people who has incorrect grammar is too damn high. Uh. Uh. So one of the ones we used to get hit with early on, our clients, the client would ask us to use broken grammar and spelling to <laughs> simulate what they get. Um, you get frustrated because you know that'll lower your success rate. Heck, maybe you go ahead and do it. And you send out the broken grammar, you end up frustrated. The client's given his company a false sense of security. So by winning, by winning the negotiation, when the client was pushing you to, when the client was, was pushing you to use the broken grammar, he just lost. And that's, uh, that's my number one rule of negotiating. If anyone loses, everyone loses. It's yep. kind of like the if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. It's actually, if anybody ain't happy, ain't nobody going to be happy. Yep. So, grammar Grammar. Nazis be like, wait, no, are like, okay. All right, so communicate with the organization and tell them how exactly that happens, that the broken grammar actually reduces the effectiveness of testing the humans. They're trained. They know that if you're sending email to look like it's coming from a company as part of a a phishing campaign uh, to have it be somewhat legitimate and there's incorrect grammar, do you think many people send out emails as their corporate organization as part of some marketing type of thing with incorrect grammar? Probably not. Not usually because that probably goes through about 12 rounds of proofing. Um, and, And absolutely. Now start going and digging into your spam and showing them to the people you're working with, like, look, I just got this email. It was spam. <laughs> and the grammar is immaculate. This is, this is key. You know, like, if you're in that situation, the client just feel it seems like the client just won't listen to reason. Your goal, or your, you know, your boss won't listen to reason, what have you. Your goal is to, you know, kind of take a breath, stay present, and get creative. And if you can just stick with it and try again, you'll often get a much better result. And so it's like, okay, well, tell me more about what your concern is. Why are you digging your heels in? And they say, all the stuff we ever get has broken grammar. And you say, okay, let me show you some of the stuff that I get that isn't. And that be- yep. ends up being convincing. And, and be willing to, uh, to do both. Send some with broken and send some with good grammar and send it to two s- disparate groups within the organization and see how the numbers turn out. And that's where creativity gets you that better result. Yep. So I love this one. Some cops are Jedi. They're just holding this fence back with the Jedi mind trick. All right. Okay. So sometimes your fish is so good that some federal authority gives you a call and said, what in the hell are you doing? Yeah. So, Yes. Why? Because in many of the cases, the organization that you're sending the email into uh, doesn't involve enough people to tell them that, hey, we're doing a phishing campaign. And then they escalate appropriately, and they escalate way too far. Like, and when we've, so we've had this kind of thing happen a couple times, and, um, and when it happens, it usually starts with the engagement where the client says, The only people who are going to know about this phishing exercise are me and my boss. We're both on the phone. No one else is going to know about it. Not the help desk, not HR, not legal. Not audit, not whoever. No one. And then what happens? They get one. It goes to some C-level manager, and the C-level manager freaks out and says, oh, my gosh, this is super illegal. We need to report this. And so they contact someone, and they call the IT department, and the IT security guy calls, reaches out to their InfraGuard contact, and next thing you know, the federal authorities are involved. Yeah, (laughs) that's not a good day. Trust me, we're invincible, or invisible, rather. Yeah. Nope, nope, didn't see that, didn't see that. 
Okay. So, so like we said before, this is your project. Whether you're whether you're the outside, whether you're the outside consultant, whether whether you're a mid-level manager, whether you're the person, you know, lowest in the totem pole. Nobody works for you. Realize you have to lead. You make this a mandatory part of the test. When you're explaining what the test is, you manage everyone's expectations. Here are the steps in the test. We're going to follow steps one through one through eight. And step three is you've got to you've got to involve HR and legal. And that and that may that that usually means that somewhere right there you're going to sit down with your client and brainstorm who needs to who might get called in the escalation and so who needs to know about this um, in terms of effective ways to do that tell this story so tell our stories or tell other people's stories the human mind is basically set to remember stories and to pass them along it's what kept us alive so use stories and yep. then finally know your organization Yep, and uh, tell them about some of the escalation paths and maybe have some of those folks at some of the top of the escalation know about the phishing test um, so that they can, you know, they can put off calling the authorities and involving all sorts of legal actions. Okay, so at first you don't succeed, fail, fail again. <laughs> okay, I love Grumpy Cat. Okay. All right, so the story of the unhappy client, right? You do this awesome phishing campaign, you had a high success rate, or you, depending on what success is for your, for your customer or for the people you're working with, the, the, the outcome for this phishing campaign was fantastic. You got it in front of a bunch of eyes and they didn't fall for it because they had great training or they did fall for it because they had really poor training. And then you start writing the report and you're, you're almost done with the report and you're ready to turn it into the client and they said, hey, did you guys finish the test? Uh, um, like two weeks ago, <laughs> uh, yeah. And maybe, or maybe just otherwise, you just you did the you do the test, you achieve great results, you feel like it was totally success, and your and your client, um, your client, if you're outside or your boss, just feels like it, the effort didn't go well. They didn't feel the love. Hey, they didn't feel like how, they're how many results? Hey, how many results? That's the other one. What hey, if how many your results? Client calls you. What if your client or somebody calls you every thirty minutes? You're trying to get your darn job done. You're trying to do the fishing, and you keep getting all these phone calls. What do you do about it? How many results? Yeah. Success. <laughs> all right. Happy client is a good client, right? A good client is a happy client. Okay. Set some expectations about the types of communication you're going to give to them during the engagement. Um, manage their expectations. Hey, we're going to give you some, some updates you know, a couple of times on the first day because it's typically when a lot of the results come in. Uh, and then we're going to, I'm going to call you end of the day tomorrow and uh, I'll call you the end of the day after that, let you know how many results. Uh, and then uh, we'll let you know when it's over and you know when it should be over, the call to action. Uh, but some people are still going to do stuff after the call to action. So we'll let you know when some of these come in while we're writing the report. Uh, so next thing you know, you're going to write the report. We'll tell you when the report will be there. Um, set the stage for when you're going to do the communication so there's no surprises. Manage, manage expectations. And then finally, empathize with your client. Your client usually has been rooting for this for a long time, or your boss has been rooting for some kind of security test for a long time because they think that there's something to be worried about. Yep. Don't reinvent the wheel. Okay. Don't do this every time you do a phishing campaign if you do multiple. Even if you're doing it in your own organization, retain the infrastructure that you built and fix the infrastructure based on lessons learned from your engagement. Don't spool this stuff every time. Uh, what we found many years ago is that when we were doing this stuff, every one of our, our uh, consultants would spool up new infrastructure for every test and every one of them did it differently. And everyone had different problems. And we weren't learning anything. Yep, because we were too busy trying to fix problems. Okay, so we want you to fail more. Okay, you guys are so innovative, right? Create, so maintain, is, and publicize. The fix is either use existing good free tools, we like Fishing Frenzy a lot, or develop your own. And whatever you choose, lock in on it for a while and teach everybody how to use it. Maybe even record that, maybe even record when you teach everybody how to use it. So you can get everybody on the same page, and that means that every assessment you do after that makes you better at doing this. Because now if you build any new, in, if you build onto the infrastructure, you're building a capacity you didn't have before. Yep. So Aut Automate and script it so that you can reuse it multiple times. Okay. I love this one. Roses are red. My name is not Dave. This makes no sense. Microwave. Right? Okay. Sounds like what, my poetry. What? What, what, what are you talking about? Exactly. We have no idea what we're talking about because we didn't follow up with the right people after the engagement to see how they thought it went. Okay. What they, and what did they do after the campaign? 
And this is one we didn't even know was a failure. This is one we didn't even know we were failing at. So because we had an unknown hard error, right? We had no idea what, what the outcome was. And we learned when a client called us and started telling us about the results of the phishing. They said, okay, ever since you, ever since you did that phishing, you've raised our reporting rates, you've reduced our click rates because they're still testing themselves. And they said, we're getting higher report rates, we're getting, we're getting what we want. And I said, Good. holy... I've never bothered to ask a client before how that worked out for them. Like, I'd come back to them a year later, but I didn't ask them for specific numbers. And, um, yeah, find out. Yeah. So, needless to say, we've done a lot of frustration with fishing to the point that uh, Mr. Beal used to have hair. Okay. I pulled it all out. <laughs> all of it. Okay. So, the overall lesson, what's the takeaway? Fishing is all about collaboration. Okay. Again, if you're having a conversation with two people, you're having a negotiation whether you know it or not. Jay and I negotiated several times on this stage. We did, we did, and before here and with goons. So most of the failures, most of the failures we've been describing are failures either to think ahead and communicate, collaborate, and lead. Even, that means, even when that means lead with. Yep. Um, so we hope that you'll use these stories to persuade and plan and win at fishing, at your work, at life, um, for whatever definition winning is. Remember, remember, the final story, remember the final lesson. If anyone loses a negotiation, everyone loses. So don't lose. Yeah. Right. Cool. And don't, and, and don't, the other, don't the other half lose. Thank you.